Questions 31 and 32, I think, are uh, on the challenging side. It sometimes is a little difficult to ferret through exactly what it is that they're asking. Uh, for some of these, like I said, um, when if you watch the, the very first video I did, I talked about questions that they keep and questions that they toss. And there's really no way to know which question is which. Um, if you imagine that both of these were questions that they were going to uh, ultimately drop, because remember, on Rika anyway, in fact, on uh, the majority of these uh, tests by this particular company, there's a number of questions that don't count. Uh, these might be ones that don't count, uh, or they may be ones that do. So you just have to pretty much do them as they're presented. I think in the case of 31 and 32, you might think about coming back to these. And again, I'm only suggesting stuff. It's your test and your experience, but... It's easy to get this down to maybe 50-50, or maybe it's even easy to get this down to maybe three questions, but really figuring out why uh, B is the correct answer in 31 uh, might be challenging, but let's give it a try. A fourth grade student who reads grade level narrative texts with fluency and excellent comprehension is struggling to read aloud at a grade level content area passage about a topic with which the student is familiar. The student reads the passage hesitantly, frequently stopping to reread clauses or entire sentences. Afterward, the student demonstrates limited comprehension of what is read, pardon me, what was read, which of the following factors is most likely disrupting the student's fluent reading of the text. So you have a lot of conditions in here to, to consider. First of all, is this child fluent on anything? Yes. So that's a, that's a check, okay? So I'll say fluency check. Fluency of narrative text, check. Fluency of expository or informational check uh, test, nope. There is a little problem with that. Uh, and that's where you see content area. So I'll put a little X by that. So does this child possess fluency? Yes. Does this child possess the ability to understand narrative text? Yes. And, uh, and why is that the case? Well, not only is it due to fluency, but the student uh, presumably knows the schema or the schemata, the structure of narrative text with plot setting character, rising action, falling action, etc. But when encountering expository text and reading it, maybe, and this isn't in there, so I'm, maybe I'm assuming too much, but maybe the student's reading this passage looking for characters and a plot and setting and, and descriptions and quotation marks or what have you, and just, well, I mean, informational text could have quotation marks, that's true, but it is not necessarily a story. Uh, it's not like a historical narrative. It's more like a just a you know your straightforward uh, sociology text, let's say. So what is the student doing? If you look in here, this child is not at the word level anymore. This student in the description is pausing and rereading and trying to read through entire clauses and sentences. So this indicates that the student knows that he or she doesn't understand something and is going back to try to repair. The misunderstandings. So it's not as if the child blows through the entire text and then doesn't know what's going on. A lot of short-term memory is being burned up by trying to figure out and asking questions like, what do they mean? What's this about? If the child's demonstrating very limited comprehension, as you see from the description right here, uh, it's due to the fact that the attention was spent on other things. Rather than on trying to understand what was in the text, um, this child's going back and trying to repair the text. Which of the following factors is most likely? And again, this is where we get into the most likely stuff right uh, here. And some of it might be debatable, but what factor is most likely disrupting the student's fluent reading of the text? So take a look at A, insufficient background knowledge to support the basic comprehension of the text. The only reason I, I'm able to throw that out is because right here it says that the child is uh, reading something, uh, a topic they're familiar with. You know, maybe they've seen a documentary on asteroids or uh, on uh, a particular cultural group that is uh, not quite uh, familiar to, to everyone or something like that. So the child has some familiarity, but even that level of familiarity isn't helping him or her get through this block of text that's organized in a way that is not natural to this student. So the correct response in here is B, and it says lack of experience with academic language structures used in the text. So if we're looking at conditions, then somebody who can understand something and read something fluently, like narrative text, who shows a difficulty with uh, something like uh, expository text, and is not 
not going back and rereading things at just the word level or trying to, to decode something and failing. This is a fluent reader who's going back and looking through these sentences and getting lost. Uh, so um, B is the correct response. It's the structure of the text that's difficult. If you look at C, this is uh, where I'm saying that it's, it's oftentimes hard to throw things out. Uh, insufficient monitoring of comprehension while reading the text. That's out because this child is, in fact, monitoring. There is monitoring that's going on. And let me just bring up a, uh, another uh, window in here. The child is monitoring his, lack, uh, his or her lack of comprehension. It's not as if this chi child is not actively reading something. The child is. And the only problem is that the type of monitoring that's going on is not going to maybe help the student uh, comprehend what they're what they're reading because all the time spent going on thinking why am I confused what is this saying etc. Uh, lack of grade level word analysis uh, skills for accurately decoding the text that's not the problem because if you look back in this part of the description and bring this down uh, you can see that the child's going back and looking at full clauses and full sentences in here. So since that's happening, it's not a word level problem. It's a schema problem. Next, uh, let's read this one, 32. Which of the following instructional activities would best help upper elementary English learners develop intonations and rhythms of the English language to support fluent reading? So you know that prosody is an ingredient in um, reading uh, and comprehending, for sure. It's a part of fluency, too. If you read everything in, in a Minnesota monotone like I have, uh, maybe you're going to miss some of the nuances of sarcasm or indirect speech or something like that, uh, because prosody, in other words, intonation and rhythm is, is important. So these are upper elementary English learners, and what we want to do is figure out what sort of the best activity would be for, uh, for these guys. So just give me one second to... Uh, to get back uh, out, and here's what uh, here's what the correct answer is: giving an expressive oral reading of a short text, and then having the students echo read the text as the teacher reads it aloud again. So, learning through uh, modeling and guided practice—that's something this test uh, values, and that is something that this response is demonstrating. And it is something that would actually target and focus on intonations of the and the rhythms of English. Having a native speaker model it for the students and having them repeat it, you know, it's a fine idea. What about this one? Leading a class discussion on age-appropriate topic and then having each student read aloud, that's not specialized enough. It is not focused enough. It is not really targeted enough to be a correct answer. We're looking for specific help for English learners, and the English learners need help, of course, with intonation and rhythm. This isn't targeting intonation and rhythm. You get it. Having the students record their own oral reading of a passage while listening to the recording while silently reading the passage. Uh, you know, maybe for speed or something like that, uh, just to analyze, like for something for the teacher to do as an assessment, that would be good. But they're having problems uh, picking up the nuances of, of English that you and I have developed, pro if you're a native speaker, of course, uh, over years and years and years. And so to have so two students who are really relatively new in the language being able to read like native speakers and then benefit from their own reading to themselves, highly unlikely. Encourages students to practice reading aloud a text in which stressed words and um, punctuation marks are highlighted. That it certainly is viable. There's nothing really wrong with something like this. What's wrong with it in, in uh, terms of, uh, you know, Rika land or whatever test you're, you're taking, MTEL or what have you, why is this one wrong? If you really look at it, it's because it is not directed enough at the problem. Um, the issue that's cast out or that's laid out in 32 has to be addressed by an active reading, active reading with a native speaker, active reading with a native speaker, including uh, paired practice or individual practice or something like that, some kind of guided practice. That's why C is correct. So uh, again, 31 and 32 for me were questions that were slightly, uh, I don't want to say challenging, but you really had to think about the conditions and really try to figure out what they were asking. And that tipped you off as far as what the right answers were. Let's look at 33. A second grade teacher would like to plan an activity to improve the reading rate of two students who read about the same rate and level and are both automatic readers. 
Which of the following activities would best address the student's needs? This one also is a little uh, challenging too, to figure out exactly what they're asking. And that's why I've been you know, going after those obvious questions first, you know, the ones that you, you can get uh, really fast. Because this one does take a little bit of, uh, of thought, but let's see what, what, it, uh, what it says. In this question, we know that we're dealing with a teacher who wants to help two second grade students improve um, their uh, reading rate, okay, their speed. Uh, so what is it that we would do uh, for that? Because we're dealing with two students, let's look at A, a, a cooperative silent reading activity in which the students read the same passage together silently, stopping periodically to share their understanding of the text. So what do, what's natural reading look like typically? You know, typically it's somebody sitting down and reading something silently and then you know, thinking about it. If you've ever read something at a cafe with a friend, you know, you're both reading the same article and you read through it and then you stop and you, you, you share, uh, that's, pretty, you know, that's reading in a more natural context. Since you have two students who are automatic readers and maybe they're just lagging a little bit, uh, both of them are reading at grade level, let's say, but not beyond it or much beyond it. A is your best bet for responding uh, to this um, test. It's, it's, I guess, the way to look at it, if I were to drop a tag onto it, and, and I'll do that. Uh, what you're trying to do is take these automatic readers and move closer to real context, and A is what satisfies that. If you look at uh, B, a repeated reading activity in which each student takes turns reading aloud a decodable passage to the other while the other follow, silently follows along, that probably was done with the student to give them a good foundation of fluency. But now we want to move them to a real context, so that's why B is uh, B is out. And I'll just uh, strike that one off the list. Uh, paired reading activity in which the students sit side by side, read a shared text aloud in unison, gradually increasing their pace as they proceed through a text. Again, that is probably something that they did do in order to become the automatic decoders that uh, that they are. Uh, but it's not getting them closer to a real context yet. A time partner reading activity in which the students take turns silently reading a shared text for one minute while the other student um, keeps time and says when to stop. That's more of a game. Certainly could be done maybe if they're charting uh, progress or, or doing some kind of a informal assessment using peers, but that's not getting us toward a real context. We don't read with stopwatches typically unless we're you know, on a game show and we're not. A second grader has developed the ability to decode individual words accurately, but she reads very slowly and laboriously. When the teacher tries to engage the student in oral reading activities, she says she feels embarrassed and would rather read silently. Which of the following modifications to instruction would be most appropriate and effective for helping the student improve her reading fluency? So it's not just a fluency issue we're dealing with here. This is somebody who feels slightly embarrassed. So there's like a, a performance issue, doesn't want to read in front of peers and things like that. And of the responses here to deal with this um, performance issue that the student is, is having, the best thing to do is have her reread a text several times using whisper reading to to build her fluency and confidence with the respect of the text. So what this means then is that you're going to give the student some very safe practice, practice where she doesn't have to practice in front of people or feel embarrassed or anything like that. So B is the most, I guess, humane way to, to address the, the issue. A, encouraging her to serve as an audience for other students' oral reading until she demonstrates willingness to read herself. No, that's a great way to avoid having to do anything that you don't want to do. Watch others. There. No, I don't have to do it. Teaching her how to use self-monitoring as she reads to improve her literal comprehension and ability to read with prosody. Um, you know, no, uh, because this is not going to get the student to build up confidence. What will is getting a text that you know she'll succeed with and having her reread it several times to develop confidence. D is out too, providing her with explicit phonics instruction to improve her word rec identification skills before requiring her to read aloud. Well, look, the, the child can read. Uh, the problem is has not been identified as being one with uh, decoding problems or anything of the, of, the, of the sort. It's something else. It's a performance issue. So rehearsals and practice, that's the way to go. Okay, so that brings us to this bit of fun. Um, <clears throat> here we get a lot of stimulus data that we have to try to get through. So in an actual test, something that I would advocate is I wouldn't start reading this 
uh, data set yet because you have no idea what you're reading it for. Uh, you could burn up a lot of valuable time yourself just trying to figure out what, what this thing is and how it works. And I don't think that's a very productive use of your, uh, your time. In all cases, and again, this is just a suggestion, so if you don't like it, don't do it. But I would read the questions first, and why don't we go ahead and do that? Based on the student's reading performance on this assessment, uh, instruction to increase students' uh, reading fluency should focus primarily on, and then you get a bunch of, of choices here, and you'll, you'll see that uh, choice B is the one that is uh, correct. You'll see that in, in a minute. So if you look at these responses, what you're going to do is basically apply these responses to the text. And so is it contextual analysis that the student is uh, lacking and needs uh, help? So think about contextual analysis. That would be like you're reading adolescent literature and you come to the word cool and the passage might be something like that, that teacher is the coolest teacher in the world. And, and, and if you don't understand the context in which cool is being used, maybe you think it's uh, the teacher's cold and needs a sweater, right? So context is going to play a role. Automatic word recognition is exactly what it, you uh, think it is. It's, re, it's accurately recognizing a word and not having to sound it out or self-correct it uh, or you know, read ahead a little bit and come back. It means that you just got it. You can decode it immediately. It's so decodable that it's not even decoding anymore. It's just part of your reading uh, repertoire. So maybe that's what is going on in here. Improving the student's academic language skills. So if it's a bio text from biology and the child's struggling to decode meiosis and mitosis or something like that, maybe that's what's going on. It's not. Expanding the student's oral vocabulary knowledge, perhaps a bit too, uh, too general. So I, like I said, I would be reading the questions first, just like I did before I even touch the passage, which we'll, we'll do in a second. I would even read the next question that's attached to it. When reading the last sentence of the passage, the student pronounces the word imagine is imagine, uh, or imagine, however that is pronounced. I know that we've got our little phonetic thing right here, but whatever. Uh, evidence from this assessment best supports which of the following interpretations of this word reading error. So if you're looking at uh, 35 and 36, Notice that you can answer 35 by just skimming the stimulus data. You don't have to read the whole thing. And in 36, it's the same story. You don't have to read the whole thing. You only look at the last part of it. So let's try to answer 35 right now. And I'm only going to use a slice of the passage to, uh, to do this. Uh, it looks like this is a passage that's been used as a running record. And you should get familiar with that. I'm not going to take a lot of time talking about... Um, running records or miscue analyses or calculating independent frustration and instructional reading levels, but just take a look at this. If you look at the majority of the words in here, and I didn't review the key with you and I'm not going to, but this is what the student said up here, when, and then there was a pause and a self-correction. This was a pronunciation, a pause, and then a self-correction. This is the same story, uh, pronunciation, of the word with a pause in, in the middle and a self-correction. So what this would sound like would be win, pause, window, mo, moving, kit, chen, kitchen, hap, happen, and then a self-correction. So I won't do every one of these errors with you, but that's what's going on. It's, these are polysyllabic words if you haven't noticed. And what this child is doing then is uh, encountering polysyllabic words and then sounding them out and eventually self-correcting. You would want to promote the student's automatic word recognition, especially of polysyllabic words. That's what you would want to do. Um, self-corrections are very good. They are. You know, that means the student is engaged in the reading and eventually can figure out what to do after stumbling a bit. But that is not fluent reading. Okay, it's not fluent decoding. Uh, what's fluent, what is fluent decoding? It's automatic word recognition with no pauses, no self-corrections, none of that sort of thing. If you look at the 36 now uh, and, and, and do let's, uh, when reading, let me get my pen to work, just give me one moment. When reading the last sentence of the passage, the student pronounces the word imagine as I imagine or something like that. Evidence from this assessment best supports which of the following interpretations of this word reading error. And in this 
uh, in this uh, uh, context here, you would want to, uh, the student applies syllabication and phonics rules correctly, but then does not recognize a word. That's exactly what's going on in the stimulus data. So let me show you that. If we look at imagine, which is right here, so I get the pen to uh, to function. Looks like I'm going to have a little bit of difficulty with that. That is unfortunate. So I'll have to make a big circle like this. This is the one uh, where she sounded it out. There's not a lot of syllabication going on, breaking it apart. What's going on is just a sounding out and perhaps incorrectly. Everything else is self-corrected. Every other polysyllabic word was self-corrected, presumably because the child has heard of a bedroom. And, and, and looking right above, right here, where the child uh, knows what a bedroom is says bed bedroom bedroom and gets it because it registers and so all of the other words seem to to register except for imagine so that's sort of how you pick apart what's going on in here because it is d that's correct the student applies syllabication and phonics rules correctly but does not recognize the word so i guess the sounding out in their way that they have phonetically laid this out it is imagine or something like that so I learned the international phonetic alphabet, and so you'll probably want to review just your standard dictionary v uh, pronunciation, but there are many. I like uh, IPA better, but who cares? Uh, the rest of these, a student recognized the base word but is unaware of phonological shifts. That's not what's going on in here. The entire thing was just sounded out and never self-corrected or reassembled. The student is unfamiliar with syllabication rules governing uh, medial consonants. No, that's not it at all. This child is syllabicating this thing correctly it looks like m ma jin but uh doesn't repair it in the end so b is out the student does not apply appropriate phonics generalizations to the last uh, two syllables of the word well they say it was pronounced correctly so we'll take it at face value that it was the thing that's most correct is this the student applies syllabication and phonics rules correctly but does not recognize the word and again you can see that because the big tip off even if you're you know, kind of having trouble with that phonetic alphabet that um, they gave us, is just to look at those self-corrections. They dominate this passage. The only one that wasn't self-corrected was this, and there was a skipped word right here. But if we're trying to explain this one away, it never registered when the student, uh, when the student read it. Okay, let's take a look at the 37 if we could. Lately, when choosing a book to read, a third grader who reads a grade level always selects books from a series that is written in a very formulaic style that does little to extend his conceptual or language development. The teacher's best response to the behavior would be, okay, so here's a student who's stuck in a particular genre, in a particular type of uh, familiar book, reading it because maybe the characters are slightly interesting or that it, because it's easy. So how do you address this in um, this model of reading instruction? You can't just leave it alone. You're aware of an issue, so you've got to deal with it. So A is out. Point out to the student that some of the, of the major limitations of the books he is choosing to read and ask him to read those, uh, not to read those books at school. I mean, that's really kind of mean, isn't it? Here this uh, young person is having success with something, and here you want to, that, that option is to humiliate him. Nah, not a good idea. Advise the student that he should choose books that will prepare him for the more difficult reading you will encounter in fourth grade. Okay, so what is the in the now thing that we could do instead of humiliating or, or nagging? Simply provide the student with books with similar themes or on similar topics that are more challenging for him. You might not even say it's more challenging. You might just say, I think you'll like these. So that's what this model supports anyway. And you should too, I guess. A second grade student is limited vocabulary knowledge, which hinders the student's word recognition and reading comprehension. The student's oral reading is slow and labored, and the student typically spends the majority of independent reading time browsing through books, making little effort to read the actual words on the page. Research has shown that which of the following is most likely to happen if the student receives no instructional intervention. So. You have a struggling reader who is clearly um, spending time that could be used to improve reading, finding strategies to avoid uh, doing actual reading. So would research say this? The student will, will always be behind a average performing peers, but will never achieve an adequate reading level to be academically successful. No, that's not the case. We know, or we hope at least, hope, 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 
that by actually doing the act of reading and doing the act of reading on independent level books, even if those are maybe a grade level or five behind, that eventually you'll catch up. Eventually the student will catch up. The student will naturally begin to show more interest and proficiency in reading as the student matures and will catch up with uh, average performing peers in the third grade. There's no way to, to, to know that. It's just as likely the student will continue to fall behind unless something is done, right? The student will remain approximately at second grade reading level in this and will not be able to progress beyond this level. Well, I would hope that that's not the case. What the current belief is, is that uh, you know, read, good readers continue to improve because they're good readers. They continue to read, and they read more, and they read widely. And this student will begin to fall behind peers in reading development and will continue to fall further behind in later grades as texts include increasingly difficult vocabulary. That's what happens to uh, you know, uh, textbooks, right? Um, they get increasingly more complex, and the grammar becomes more con complex, so does the vocabulary. So if this student who's not reading and is already struggling, if something isn't done, that will only become magnified, according to this model of reading instruction. All right, let's look at uh, 39 now. Uh, which of the following statements best explains an important limitation of teaching students to rely on context as their primary strategy for determining the meanings of unfamiliar words? So we know context is really important, very, very important. And I go over this in much greater detail in the, in, in the videos, why context is always your last choice for vocabulary words. They want the kids decoding. They want the kids syllabicating. They want the students structurally analyzing, you know, looking at Greek and Latin roots. Context is always last, and this is why. It's very clear uh, what their position is. Explicit context clues about a word's meaning are not very common in most texts, while implicit contextual clues often require students to apply background knowledge uh, they lack. If you've never experienced this, you know, just try to read anything in, uh, get a journal article that deals with uh, statistics. Pick your favorite statistics test. Uh, something like, uh, go, you know, go read up on propensity score matching and see how far you get. There is no glossary that comes with, you know, academic journal articles on propensity score matching. There's no help. It's, all, it's assumed that you know everything. So that's why even if you use context as your primary uh, means of understanding vocabulary, there's often a lack. Now, if you're reading that uh, any really high-level article, sometimes knowledge of Greek and Latin roots can also help you too, but it may, that may not be insufficient. But anyway, this is the reason that context is always last. Context clues have limited usefulness for students who already have a well-developed background knowledge related to a text um, subject or content. Not really, uh, not really true, because the higher you go on the uh, ladder, the more complicated the texts become and more less familiar and more specialized the texts are. Uh, using context to determine the meaning of an unfamiliar word disrupts students' reading fluency and more, and more significantly than simple, simply consulting a dictionary. Well, that's not true. That is a criticism of using context, is that it, def, it breaks up fluency. But, I mean, nothing uh, would disrupt your fluency more while you're reading something if you have to go to a dictionary and look everything up, you know, uh, after reading every other word. So B is just not logical. Although it is a criticism, understand that, that they do think that simply relying on context is going to take away from, uh, from fluency. Uh, Over-reliance on context as a word learning strategy hinders the student's vocabulary growth since they should be learning uh, most new words in direct vocabulary instruction. I think that this, the assumption in there is, is, uh, is wrong. Direct instruction certainly can help, but so does wide reading. There's many things that, uh, that can help. This is really seeing if you buy into their reading instruction model. And by buying in, what I mean is uh, they want decoding first, syllabication second, structural analysis next, and, and context last for this reason right here. Okay, um, I've gone on for almost half an hour, so I am going to pause and come back and do 40 through 50.